Shalom, shalom, family. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. As you all can tell by the title today, we're going to be getting to the, um, the long-awaited, the anticipated video on the Yoruba. All right. We're going to get into the history of our Yoruba brother and sister today. I know um, a lot of you brothers and sisters have been in the comments over the last few weeks, couple months, asking for this video, and I finally found the time to, you know, do my research and find a history on these people. So that's what we're about to do today. As I said earlier, we're about to get into the history of the Yoruba people, all right? All right, shalom, shalom. All right, so before we get started, of course, I'm going to give our praises, honor, and glory to our Father, to our Elohim above, for giving us the ability to gather here today on this Shabbat day to review the history of his people, his dispersed ones, beyond the rivers of Nubia, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, all right? So today we're going to start off with this quick verse, share my screen, start off with this quick verse to um, start things off on the right track. And we'll be reading from Isaiah 46, verse 9. All right, Isaiah 46, verse 9. And it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am Yah, and there is none else. I am Yah, and there is none like me. All right, so that's what we'll be doing today. We'll be reviewing or remembering the former things of old. We will be reviewing or remembering the former things within our history regarding the Yoruba. So who were the Yoruba before they got to West Africa? Who are these people's ancestors? Where do they come from? All right? Who are they? It's been a lot of talks about um, who these people are within the Israelite community. So of course, you know, we got to put some clarity to that today. So let's go ahead and get into the presentation. Get my screen ready, get a sip of water, and we can get into it. Make sure everything's set up good. All right. So, the Yoruba people um, are an ethnic group that inhabits Western Africa, mainly the countries of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. All right. So, the Yoruba number around 38 million people. All right. So, this is a big group, a vast group. The vast majority of the Yoruba population is from Nigeria, where the Yoruba make up around 15% of the country's population. We know there's other um, Israelite tribes within Nigeria as well. But most of the Yoruba people speak the Yoruba language, which is in the Niger-Congo language, all right? So some people believe the Yoruba to be of Egyptian descent or Arab, all right? Today we'll be showing the ancestor of the modern day Yoruba peoples. All right. So today we will be showing the ancestors of the modern day Yoruba people. Or who the Yoruba, who these peoples um uh, came to be known as the Yoruba, basically. All right. So first book we'll be jumping into is Hebrewisms of West Africa, source on the left. All right, and we will start at the very top section where the highlighted section begins. All right, so there can be little doubt that the Yoruba people are at least intimately connected with the orientals all right so there could be no doubt that the yorubas are at least connected with the orientals or the middle easterners as they like to call them their customs bear a remarkable resemblance to those of the races of asia all right and we know when speaking of asia they're speaking of the middle east or the levant or northeast africa it goes on to say their vocabulary teams with words derived from some of the semitic languages and there are many natives of Yoruba land to be found having features very much like those of Syrians and Arabians. All right. And I could have brought another source out just to piggyback off this last sentence right here. But I'll just verbally state it. If you know the book Hebrew, um, that's not it. It's called, uh, let me think, let me think. Negro in a New World by Sir Harry Johnston. All right. He states specifically that. The Syrians um, appear to be a Negroid 
race and they passed the, their features down to the Syrians, I mean, to the Jews, all right? So the Syrians were a Negro race and they passed their features down to the Jews, all right? But here we see that the Yoruba off top are being connected to these Semitic speaking peoples or these peoples of the Near East. All right, so we're going to continue on. And next, we're beginning to the religion of the Yorubas, especially in relationship to the religion of ancient Egypt. All right. So, of course, we'll be starting at the top left. All right. Shalom, shalom. So Sir A.C. Burns, following Professor Leo, the German explorer of Africa, says that it is possible, excuse me, that it is probable that the Yoruba were not originally of Negro blood. All this suggests that the, the Yorubas were at one time in Asia, all right? And we know what we um, they're talking about when they say Asia, and that Asia may be regarded as their original home, all right? So again, these people are being said to not be from the interiors of Africa, but Near East migrants. The probability is further strengthened by the fact that the name of Nimrod, corrupted by the Yorubas to Lamrod, figures prominently in the Yoruba mythology. There is, however, one remark which must be added to the comment on this statement. In the first place, it must be pointed out that although the Yorubas might belong to the tribe of Nimrod, they must not be regarded as children of Canaan, as Sultan Bello suggested, all right? And Sultan Bello, I believe he is a Yoruba, and he um, made, a, I believe, a book or something stating that the Yoruba were from the lost children of Canaan, all right? But he's stating, but this author just said that the Yoruba might belong to the tribe of Nimrod, but that must not be regarded as to the children of Canaan, all right? Cush and Canaan were brothers. Nimrod was the son of Cush, and hence the members of the tribe of Nimrod could not have been remnants of the children of Canaan. The rejection of the view of an Arabian origin does not affect the probability of an Asiatic origin far as the Yorubas are concerned, all right? So although this author is rejecting this theory of them coming from Mecca, He's not throwing out the probability that they are of Asiatic origin. As a matter of fact, some people seem to regard Chaldea as the original home of the Yorubas. Some writers, by laying emphasis on Hebrew idioms and customs, indirectly suggest Palestine. They forget that the idioms and customs are not, excuse me, are not peculiar to Hebrews, but are also found amongst other Semitic peoples. The Rubles came into contact with the Chaldean is, in their opinion, strongly suggests some traces which the Chaldean language seemed to have left on the Yoruba language. So, for example, the name Aki is very common in Yoruba land and signifies the name of a hero. All right. Going down to another example right here in the highlighted section, it says, for example, the Sumerian word L, excuse me, that says C. All right, so let me start over. For example, the Sumerian word C means life. This becomes C in the Yoruba and possesses exactly the same meaning. So the Sumerian word C it possesses the same exact meaning in the Yoruba language, just showing that they were indeed in this location. That doesn't mean they are these people. It just shows that they were in, in this location that they have influences within their language, you know, from speaking with them, exchanging different things. It goes on to say the evidence given above is too, excuse me, it says the evidence given above is too flimsy to support the theory that the original home of the Yorubas was in the land between the Euphrates and the Tigris. The Tigris. The theory cannot be accepted until it is based on data supplied by scientific research. All right, we're going to continue to dig into this. One more example will be given. The West African word ye which means to exist, all right, is subject to many changes in the different languages. E sometimes become A or I or O or O or the or, or these vowels nasalize. Throughout all these changes, the meaning remains the same. For the sake of convenience, the root word is designated ye in these words. The word occurs in several of the leading West African languages, such as the Tasha, the Ewe, the Ga, and the Yoruba as well as the 
Edo. And we know that this Yi word will be we will be derived from the word Yah or Ahaya, as it'll go on to state in this next verse. It says, it is quite probable that the word is of Semitic origin and that it comes from the root word, which means to live or to exist. The Hebrew word for to be, to exist, is haya. The first part of the word ha varies when the verb is con conjured and must have been left out when the word had adopted by the peoples who afterward migrated to West Africa. So they're saying the first part of the word haya must have been left out when these people ended up migrating into West Africa, all right? It is noteworthy that all the changes which the second part undergoes in the process of this conjugation are reflected in the different forms of the word in West African languages. The word is also used to consonate sense. For example, in Yoruba, yi yi me means my mother or she who causes me to live, all right? Yi yi is often contracted to yi, or modify is iya. The meaning remains unchanged. All right. So just showing you that connection to that Near East with even throughout the language, as well as the author saying in the beginning that the Yoruba definitely were not of Negro blood, as well as it saying that it was quite probable that they were of Asiatic origin. All right. Continuing. It says, let's start right here. It says it is worth noting that in some cases, the sacrifice is eaten at once, as in the case of Ibo Osu, while it's in other cases, some of which have been pointed out above, the sacrifice is thrown away or must not be eaten. In some cases, the sacrifice is attached to a pole and tossed about in the wind until the last remnant of it disappears. Dealing with the sacrifices of the Yorubas, one cannot be struck with the resemblances to some of the Hebrew sacrifices, all right? Among these sacrifices described above, those which resemble the Hebrew sin offering of the Day of Atonement, the scapegoat, the Passover, the heave offering, and the consecration of the priest and the cleansing leaper, all right? So here are some, some scriptural references right below it. Once again, it's just showing that the Yorubas also have basically Hebrew customs when it comes to, or Hebrew resemblances when it comes to the case of sacrifices, as it stated, the Hebrew sin offering, day of atonement, Passover, and things of that sort. All right, so starting at the very top, commenting on the parallels between the Yoruba and the Hebrew sacrifice, Dr. Pharaoh says, these various resemblances to Hebrew religious customs and legislation, particularly when taken in conjunction with the Hebrew native tradition of immigration from the east or northeast, have considerable cumulative or cumulative force. While they do not necessarily imply any trace of Semitic descent, they would seem to indicate that the Semitic Hebrew and Negritic Yorubas belong to branches which at some early stages were united to a common stem all right let me read this again the semitic hebrew and the negritic yoruba belong to branches which at some early stages were united to a common stem all right and i want you all to make sure you um stick around through the whole video because we will be bringing out the complete evidence to show that these people um were indeed amongst the original Israelite population, all right? They come from the original Israelite population. It goes on to say, and whether this is so or not, it is very possible, if not probable, that Hebrew and early Christian influence have many centuries ago have been brought down through the Sudan, but the traces of Christian influence, which may be found, are too faint to de um, degenerate, to have been introduced by European voyagers to the West Coast, all right? So they're saying... That basically the Yorubas and Semitic Hebrews at one point in time was in a common branch or was in a part of one common stem. This view traces the origin of the resemblances to contact between the Yorubas and Hebrews at some early stages. However, I reject this and I state that the Yoruba indeed were of Hebrew origin. It wasn't them coming in contact with Hebrews, it was them being Hebrews. All right, on the other hand, P. Armory seems to trace the origins 
other resemblances to the fact that the Yorubas have migrated from Egypt and that the fact that there was a close contact between Egypt and the Sudan down to the Gulf of Guinea for many years after the migration of the Yorubas and other West African tribes from Egypt. All right. Because, of course, we know they would have migrated um, through Egypt during their migrations. Uh, we're not saying that Egypt is their place of origin. We're just saying they would have probably spent time there throughout their migrations. It goes on to say, it must be said here, however, that the evidence on the subject strongly suggests that the resemblances to Hebrew culture must be traced to contact between the Yorubas and the Hebrews while it's both of them were in Egypt. And again, I reject this statement and just saying that it's not from um, contact or it's not traces. It's because the Yorubas um, ancestors were Hebrews, were these Hebrews in Egypt. All right. And when we go through this article or through this source, this author pretty much um, comes to the same conclusion that the Yoruba were of basically Israelite abstract. All right, shalom, shalom, shalom. So Yoruba may derive from Jerusalem, king of Israel. Though it is quite unlikely that expelled people would adopt the name of their conqueror in the context of an expulsion from Mesopotamia, his name could reflect reminiscences of Nabalassar, the Babylonian conqueror of Nineveh in 612 B.C., Mentioned instead of Oronion slash Jacob in some Yoruba accounts of creation, the name Yoruba itself, however, more likely to have been derived from the name of Jerubim. All right. And Jerubim was from the tribe of Ephraim. All right. So that's pretty much what we I will be, um, I guess you can say. Mm, stating today that the Yoruba would be Northern Kingdom Israelites, specifically from the tribe of Ephraim. All right, but it goes on to say, designating that the founder of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. All right, continuing on to the next source or the next page on this, because throughout, um, like I was speaking about Muhammad Bello earlier, he stated that the Yoruba were Canaanites and that they spent some time in Mecca. All right, but according to the Oyo Yoruba Chronicles, it's referring to the Yoruba migrating from Mesopotamia rather than Mecca. And this right here is pretty much going to explain that. It says, in a recent and more faithfully recorded version of the dynastic tradition of the Oyo, the original town of the ancestral Yoruba is excuse me, the original town of the ancestral Yoruba in Arabia is not called Mecca, but Madiana, all right? Independently from Johnson, the Oyo prince, Ademi, wrote in 1914 that the Yoruba together with their northern neighbors, the people of Borgu, originated from Medina. One might think that both towns, Mecca and Medina, are mentioned in the Yoruba tradition simply because they had come from Excuse me, simply because they had come to know of the people of the consequences of pilgrimages by their Muslim neighbors. This is only true to the extent that the geography of the Near East was reduced in the minds of landlocked Africans to those towns frequently mentioned in oral accounts. All right, it goes on to say, Oyo, excuse me, however, of Oyo, it appears that neither Mecca nor Medina was the name retained by the tradition for the origin or for the original hometown, but Mandiana, all right? So again, within the Oyo, it appears that neither Mecca nor Medina was the name retained by the tradition, all right? So according to the Oyo traditions, it wasn't Mecca nor Medina. It was a Madonia, all right? It says, the royal bards of the Oyo distinguish Mandina from Medina, all right, excuse me, from Medina, and they clearly localized the town beyond Mecca, all right, so this was a town beyond Mecca, this was a town beyond Arabia. Such a designation of a place of origin of the Yorubas comes close to the tradition of the provenance of Kabawa, localizing the origin, or excuse me, localizing the original home of the people in a town called Madayana, 
not yet accompanied to the Arab notion of the Near East. Both Madania and Madania seem to be names derived from the Arabic designation Medina, town or city, referring to a great city of Mesopotamia. All right, so that's why I said these people would have migrated from Mesopotamia rather than Mecca, as some scholars like to suggest. Because again, according to the Oyo traditions, Madania referred to a town in Mesopotamia, right? Referring to a great city of Mesopotamia. But let's continue to dig in, in, on that. Next page, it says, in the context of a general reevaluation of the history of the Central Sudan, it appears that the theory of a, migra of a migration of the ancestral Yoruba from Mesopotamia is in line with the history of their, neighbor, of their northern neighbors in the Niger-Tad region. All right, so not only does the Yoruba state that they migrated from Mesopotamia, it is in line with the other neighboring tribes around the Niger Chad region. All right, it goes on to say this theory does not postulate a migration of people from the Near East at an undetermined moment in time, but it does re, um, repercussion from the fall of the Assyrian Empire and to the subsequent defeat of the Egyptian Assyrian army in 605 BC. There is nothing improbable in the idea that these decisive events are reflections in the traditions of people whose ancestors seem to have fled in great numbers to West Africa. All right, so dealing with the Oyo um, traditions, it says some time ago, it was recognized that the early Sango section of the Oyo traditions reflect an episode of the 9th century Israelite history. But this analysis of a single section of the tradition found little echo. The following development provides a rough overview of the entire Oyo tradition, indicating that in fact, the pre-Jihad corpus of the tradition refers not to local, but to Israelite Assyrian origin or Israelite Assyrian history. All right, so one should ask themselves, why within the Oyo Yoruba traditions is there traditions or history revolving Israelite and Assyrians? Why is Mesopotamia in their Oyo Yoruba traditions? All right, this is clearly an indication that these people, you know, are not native to um, where they are today and that they did migrate from this place afar. All right, so the first section of the corpus of the Oyo tradition concerns early Israelite and Assyrian kings. Recite, recited in the clear sequence, the well structured or the real structured royal poems of Oyo begins with Lamrud or slash Nimrod, also the biblical name of Saragon of Akkad. He is followed by Aduduva, the legendary founder of Ife, and Aranyan slash Aranian, the legendary founder of Oyo. All right, we skip down and it says, as for Oranyan, the name ceased to stand for Jacob, the son of Isaac, also called Israel, the eponymous ancestor of the Israelites. All right, Oranyan's key position in both the Oyo tradition of origin and the Oyo creation accounts provides him with the characteristics of a singer or a central figure of a Israelite legendary, excuse me, of Israelite legend and mythology. So even within their Oyo traditions as well, we have Oranyan, who is said to be Jacob, as the legendary founder of the Oyo people, Oyo Yoruba people. All right. So the next king that is mentioned by the Oyo tradition is Alusa or Luso, who on account of his name appears to correspond to the Israelite king Joash. All right. Though at first sight, both names seem to have little in common. A simple transformation seems to have taken place. All right. So the theoporic part of the name Joe or Yahweh was replaced by the neutral El or Alu, the element, while the second part of the name was only slightly changed as or which means has given was changed to Aso. Right. You see here. It goes on to say both kings are remembered for their peaceful and beneficial reign. The last mentioned king of pre-exiled Israel is 
or Lou Bogey, who by his name, the second part of the name being a dialectical variant of Yaruba, may the people be great. All right. So a Luke Bogey seems to be equivalent to Jerubim the second. All right. And this is all within the chronicles of the Oyo people's traditions. Once again, may I add that? Continuing on, he says, he was succeeded by three further Israelite kings reigning from more than two years, Manahim, Perkat, and Hoshea. These minor kings are remembered in other contexts in the Oyo tradition as Mimi, Paku, and in other Yoruba traditions as Hayusi. All right, so these are the Israelite kings that were mentioned within the Oyo Yoruba tradition. It continues stating at the um, very bottom, the deportation of the Israelites began after the conquest of the major part of the northern kingdom by Tigla Phanasa III in um, 733 BCE, and it was continued after the fall of Samaria in 722 BCE. All right. It goes on to say, it is therefore quite plausible that neglecting the last minor kings of Israel, all your tradition concentrates on Olugabu, or excuse me, Olu Bogi, or slash Jerubim II, as the last ruler of the Israelite kingdom before its destruction and deportation of his people. All right. So, once again, the last king that was mentioned in the Oyo tradition chronicles was indeed Jerubim II, right before the deportation of the people of Israel. Continuing on. We just um digging through the Oyo Chronicles as of now. The second section of the corpus of the Oyo tradition deals with the exiles of the Israelites in the Igboho Hubo region. All right. It goes on to say within the dynastic traditions of the Oyo, it apparently corresponds to the local projection of the Assyrian exile of the Israelites in Hobor region in eastern Syria, subsequently to the Assyrian conquest of Samaria in 722 BCE. All right, so let me read this again. Within the dynastic traditions of the Oyo, it apparently corresponds. So within the Oyo tradition, it's like corresponds to the same time the Israelites will have been conquered in Samaria in 722 BC, as it stated. Apart from the spirit, um, Despite differentiation with regard to the residents of the people in Oyo and the Iboho, the semi-divine nature of the early kings, as opposed to the, the human nature of all the other kings, introduce a distinction between two categories of kings who can be shown to have been first Israelites and then the Syrians from the pre, um, excuse me, from the period of exile. All right. Continuing on. It goes on to say right here, let's see where shall we start. By confusion of sonship and successorship, the son of Solomon the V was most likely his successor Sargon II. And therefore, the tradition seems to have highlighted the difference between Israelite and Assyrian king. So even within, you know, their Oyo chronicles, their traditions, the they um, made a distinction or they highlighted the difference between the Israelite kings, which would be their kings, and, you know, the Assyrian kings. It goes on to say, indeed, after the conquest of Samaria, Sargon II deported a great number of Israelites, perhaps the majority of the population, into exile. From this point, the tradition incorporates Assyrian rulers into a list of original, or excuse me, into a list of originally Israelite kings and thus faithfully reflects the experience of exiled Israelites, all right? And while I'm at it, um, even during this time, it seems like a lot of Israelites would have been um, coming into Africa during this time. Um, we have Ebos coming into Africa, or we have Israelites coming into Ebo land um, after the Assyrian captivity. Um, we also have Bantus coming into Africa after the Assyrian captivity. So that's why this story um, basically speaks so much credence and so much truth because we also have other tribes that we know came out this same captivity. Now, it goes on to say, contrary to other African peoples, such as the neighboring Igbo in southwestern Nigeria, 
the Yoruba never claimed an Israelite identity, all right? So they never even claimed to be Israelites, although they have this heritage. It goes on to say, although several authors pointed out the existence of Israelite customs among the Yorubas, they saw them as outside effects of Israelite influences and not as the results of direct cultural transfer through migration from the northern kingdom of Israel, all right? So rather than, you know, these missionaries, these travelers, you know, these um people that was you know, studying and amongst the Yoruba, rather than them just outright acknowledging them as descendants of Northern Kingdom Israelites, they'll be like, oh, they picked these customs up from influences. You know, um, that's that's basically what they would say, as he just stated. He goes on to say, more recently, re-examination of the Oyo dynastic tradition in combination with the comparison of cultural traits lead to the conclusion that direct links, all right, direct links, must have existed between the northern Israelites and the Yoruba. However, owing the inc incomplete study of the Oyo tradition, this conclusion did not indicate the, the precise nature of the historical connection between ancient Israel and the Oyo Yoruba. From a comparative analysis of Oyo dynastic tradition and Near Eastern history, it appears that Israelites migrated to West Africa subsequently to the fall of the Assyrian Empire, all right? So they was migrating to West Africa all the way up to the fall of the Assyrian Empire, all right? I want to ask you all real quick, what does this sound like within the scripture, right? What event? It goes on to say, and their descendants survive as the core people of the present day Oyo Yoruba, all right? Let me read that again. Israelites migrated to West Africa subsequently to the fall of the Assyrian Empire and that their descendants survive as the core people of the present day Oyo Yoruba. Indeed, Oyo tradition, all right? Oyo tradition, all right? Yoruba Oyo tradition reveals that the ancestral Yoruba were mainly composed of Israelites, who in the course of their history became influenced by Assyrian views of past events, all right? So again, the Yoruba will be descendants of these Israelites that found their way into West Africa after the Assyrian um, exile, basically. And here's that king's list that he was speaking on earlier, how they derive, um put a difference between the Israelite kings right here on the left and the Assyrian kings. There will be um, Aranya, Jacob, Israel, Ajaka, which is Isaac, all right, Omosanda, which will be King Jehu, Aluso, Joaz, Alogo, Buji, Jerubim, all right, and even down here we have Hosea. All right, so quick review. The initial branch of the Yoruba will have been a part of those exiled Israelites going into Africa, wandering into Nigeria to form several kingdoms, all right? This would match with the biblical narrative, which states in 2 Ezra 13. Hosea, excuse me, Hosea also stated that Israelites would be beyond the rivers of Cush, right? Which was a prophecy, which was later verified or which was verified later by Israelite travelers, such as um, Benjamin of Toledo. Eldad the Danite, right? Historians, all right? Even Arab travelers and Europeans. A lot of people like to equate culture to ethnicity, meaning if we see a people today who aren't keeping Torah 100% or the way that they see the Ashkenazi doing it, then they can't be Israelites, all right? So that's what they say. They're not keeping no tradition. They're not keeping no um, culture. These are the things they like to say, so they can't be Israelites, but why did Israel get exiled from their land in the first place, all right? Was it because they were keeping Torah or was it because they were being a cake not turn? And again, I stated that I believe the Yoruba would be of this um, Northern Kingdom tribe, specifically the tribe of Ephraim. And even when we look in the scripture, we see that Ephraim, you know, was, uh, 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 um, I guess you can say a stiff necked tribe. And he had a lot of, you know, whoredoms going on. And that's really why he was called a cake not turned in the first place. But let's jump to Hosea 5 real quick. We'll start at verse 3 and we'll just read something real quick in the states. I know Ephraim 
in Israel, not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. All right, so Ephraim defiled Israel. They will not frame their doings to turn to their God. All right, so they wouldn't even turn to Yah. And they was in the land. All right, they was in the land of Israel, and they would not turn to the Most High. For the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. All right, so this, the Father just said they literally, I mean, Hosea just said they literally did not know the Father. Although they are the children of Ephraim, although they are in Samaria, although they are in the land of Israel, they going off. Verse five, and the pride of Israel do testify to his face. Therefore, shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. All right. So this is what we saw when the 10 tribes was carried up into Assyria, when they was exiled out of Assyria. This was because of their iniquities. Judah also shall fall with them, all right? Because didn't the scriptures say that Judah also um, committed adultery alongside Israel? Verse 6, they shall go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from him. So we just read right here, the Most High told us that he hath withdrawn his face from them during this time period, all right? Verse 7, they have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah and the trumpet in Ramia. Cry loud at Bethava after the O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. Have I made known that which shall be surely, all right, which shall surely be, excuse me. All right, so again, this verse is just to show that even in the land of Israel, the tribe of Ephraim was not, you know, doing right by the Most High. And of course, they was committing many whoredoms and they was exiled because of it. So my main point in bringing this whole verse out was to just show you or just to ask you, do you think these people would continue to fall further in iniquity as they continue to migrate into Africa, you know, mingle with other tribes? Um, pick up different languages, pick up different customs, things of this sort, or would they fall back into Torah? We see that they wasn't even keeping everything right or doing everything right by the Lord while they was in the land. All right. But let's continue. We can also verify that Northern Kingdom Israelites were exiled to Africa through other outside resources. Um, and the source we can use for that is the Sanhedrin, verse 94, from the Talmud, all right, from the Talmud, the Ashkenazim Talmud. And they literally states in here that the Gemara asked, to where did Sanhedrin exile the ten tribes? And Marzutra replied, he exiled them to Afriki, all right? So according to Marzutra in the Talmud, the ten tribes were exiled to Afriki, to Africa. And even we see that the Ashkenazi wrote a letter to the ten tribes in Africa, right, in 1880. If you go to um, this site right here, look up Letter to the Lost Ten Tribes, they give you the exact date this um, letter was written and everything. And it says right here, where shall we start? Let's see, let's see. Where I guess we can start at the very top. It says, Thus send the dwellers of the land of Israel who abide by the Torah of Moses, um, which is a gift and inherited portion to our brothers, the children of Israel, the sons of Isaac, the son of Abraham, who revealed the belief in Hashem. They are our holy and pure brothers, the righteous upon whom the world rests, the Benai Moshe, servant of Hashem, who dwell across the river Samvoitan, also known as Sabontian. And who pledge allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne, and who rules over the ten tribes, whose settlements is in the land beyond the rivers of Nubia. All right, so once again, it has been verified that these ten tribes, after being exiled from Assyria, made their way into Africa. And this would be a accurate migration map of the Yoruba from um, Assyria, from Mesopotamia, specifically. Mandinia, all right, as they describe in their Oyo Chronicles rather than Mecca. So they would have came back down here. And even in 2nd Ezra, it tells you that 
Israelites nor the kingdom of Israelites would have been left within Jerusalem or left within the most highest borders. So that there tells you that they would have been migrating back west. All right. So this is a more accurate migration route of what they would have took into Nigeria. All right. So before we get to traditions and customs, I'm going to take a quick break and handle sun right quick. Give me one, two minutes and I will be right back. Let me put something on for you real quick. Great. Nigeria was always a united country, united by, by culture and several predispositions in geography and history. To be honest, when we go for, from as far back as we can think about it, all the migrations through Africa from the Middle East down to West Africa and right down to Southern Africa and up again to Zimbabwe and into Nigeria. And that's how Nigeria was formed. It was a migration that lumped so many people together and different waves of mig migrations came. The last that came was the Fulani migration. That's the last of the, of the menu. But that was how almost all the other groups moved into Nigeria. There is a sense in which all the languages across Nigeria are actually seasoned from one source. I mean, there is a book, there's a book in, 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 exist, in existence on when Igbo and Yoruba were one language. And reading that book, you don't even, on, on a daily basis, you listen to the two languages and you find that the root words are virtually the same across the board. And it is not only these languages. If you, if you pursue the migration to Southern Africa, you will find that very many of the languages in Southern Africa, those migrations that move from West Africa to South Africa before moving up again to, to Central Africa, all of them have common root words. In fact, if you, if you listen to, to Zulu speech, you will hear Edo words that mean exactly the same things across the board. So that when we are discussing how different we are, and you see a, a Kanu telling us that he's, uh, he's Jewish, the truth is that the Jewish migrations into Africa pulled so many of the different groups together. If an Igbo man is a Jew, then the Yoruba man is also a Jew. If an Igbo man is a Jew, then the Yoruba man is also a Jew. The truth is that all those migrations had common sources. And so... All right, family, I'm back. I'm back. My bad. I had to handle something real quick. And yeah, I know a, a lot of people considered um, the Yoruba to be of Judah, um, especially the Count brothers here. But until somebody can show me some documentation um, showing that the Yoruba are Judah, besides just saying it, then, you know, that'll be something different. But yeah, I know a lot of people say that the Yoruba um, are Judah. But let's get back to our traditions and customs. All right, so we have the source right here to the left. Light in a, excuse me, light in a once dark world. All right, by John. All right, so childbearing and male child prominently. All right, so we get into some customs and traditions of the Yoruba that would basically connect them to, you know, Israelites and other Near Eastern um, traditions. It says it is established in this paper that the major, major reason why marriage is seen as essential practice is because Yorubas love and cherish children. John Walton poises or poises that every aims at partu excuse me at perpetuation itself forever, and it is as a matter of necessity that the descendants of the dead do not die out. The African marriage generally emphasizes childbearing as a rational for the coming together of a man and woman. More specifically, Yoruba people place premium on childbearing after at most a year of marriage. If there are not issues or children after a few years of marriage, the family begins to look for alternatives, which may include getting another wife for the man. This is to make sure that the lineage or the family name is protected through and here. All right. It is a cultural norm of the people of the ancient Near East. All right. So once again, this is a cultural norm of the peoples of the ancient Near East, because even throughout our culture, we know everything goes through the seed of our father. 
We know that um, we are who our father is. We know we are of our father's house. All right. That's why we are called Israelites, right? Because we come from Israel, Jacob. But it goes on to say the ground or or uh, the ground of difference between the Yoruba and the ancient Near East is that the latter does not use the idea of surrogacy. All right. While it is coming, practicing later. One without a male child is not considered to be the tendency of a continuity of the lineage history and his duties to their ancestors have be have been repudiated all right so continuing on we see polygamy all right this is a common practice between the two the yoruba and the ancient near east there exist similar conditions on on the grounds by which husband men marry many wives both in the ancient near east and in the yoruba culture all right so we see polygamy is um a key thing amongst the Yoruba, the Yoruba. It goes on to say some of these include fame. If here believe that the number of wives you are able to marry determines the level of your prominence and significance, childlessness. Um, it goes on to say procreate labor. Many of those who marry many wives do it do so as to have the children work their farm land. All right, which is basically what we used to do. It goes on to say these, among several others, are why people in the ancient Near East and Yoruba culture go polygamy. All right. And we have scripture references to polygamy to the right in the first box, Genesis verses um, 4, 19, Genesis um, 29, verse 30, Second Chronicles 13, verse 21, as well as Judges chapter 8 and verse 30. We go on down, we see widow inheritance. All right. So the idea is called Usopu in Yoruba culture. This also exists in the Middle East. The Yoruba, the Yoruba people believe that the wife of the deceased, as enunciated or enunciated above, must be willed to a younger brother of the deceased. All right. So we know this is uh, seen throughout scripture. This is to be able to take care of the wife and the children, especially when the children of the deceased are still very strong. All right. And we see a scripture um, example of this or a scripture reference to the wife being um, given it to the deceased, to give it to the deceased brother, rather. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, if, um, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall marry without an, unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, right, and take him to wife, or take her to wife. As well as we see the last thing down here is betrothal. This is a, another unique feature to, that, that brings Yoruba and the ancient Near East to a close edge. This practice is also echo in the story of Rebecca's betrothal to Isaac. And her quick decision to leave her father's household once the marriage contract was concluded. All right. So even with um brothers out here saying sex is marriage and things like that, you know, none of our ancestors practice that mess. None of our people today in West Africa uh, practice that mess. We all go through a process. We all go through um, stages of marriage. You know, sex is alone. is not marriage. The Yoruba culture has... This concept is well, several rich men in the Yoruba setting often but thrall their children to their fellow men as wives, even without the consent of the would-be couple. All right. And as well, we see scripture references to be thrall throughout Genesis chapters 34, 11 through 12, and Exodus chapter 22, verses 16 through 17. All right. So again, this is just culture, um, customs that links them to Israelites and um, Near Eastern cultures. Right, so the next thing we'll be going to now is this right here. This um, article, I believe, is coming from Rethinking Yoruba Culture in the Light of the Yoruba Origins. All right, and it says, The theory or Hebraic or Jewish origin proposed that the Yoruba culture is a product of, of Jewish culture. All right, so Samuel, the first African bishop, is one of the earliest writers to propose that the similarities between the Yoruba and Israelite cultures are indications that the Yoruba culture originated in Israel, all right? The Yorubas and the Jews share these cultural aspects, among others. Circumcision, the division of tribes into separate families, a very frequently into the number of 12, 
the um, rigid interdiction of marriage between families too nearly related, blood sacrifices, with the sprinkling of blood upon the altar and doorposts, all right, a specific time for mourning for the dead, during which they shave their heads, all right, even they do that, and wearing sword and um, tattered clothes, all right, so that's um, basically like ashes and sackcloth type stuff right there. It goes on to say demonical possessions, purification, and other usages probably of Jewish origin, all right, and I just want to throw this scripture out here. Malachi 4 and 4, remember ye the laws of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to you in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. All right. And we see here that the Yoruba were able to maintain or their ancestors um, were able to maintain and pass down a lot of this tradition, a lot of these um, customs, specifically these laws of Moses that was commanded to our ancestors. Right. So continuing on. Next, we're going to jump to the Yoruba-speaking peoples of the slave coast of West Africa. All right. And it states, there appear to be a good reason for supposing that the institutions of a general day of rest, not only among the Yorubas, but in most, if not all, other cases may, to, may be referred to as moon worship. All right. So they refer to the Yoruba worship as moon worship. But let's see if that actually is so. It goes on to say that the first day of the first week of the lunar month is reckoned from the appearance of the new moon and was, we think, a moon festival or holy day sacred to the moon. All right. That's what they say. So, again, they try to propose here that, you know, the Yorubas are moon worshipers because they are observing the new moon feast. Again, they state right here that. The first um, day of the first week of the lunar month is reckoned from the appearance of the new moon and was, we think, a moon festival or a holy day sacred to the moon. All right. And we just saying right here that this is a tradition and custom that our ancestors used to do. Right. Example is Numbers 10 and 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in the days, excuse me, and in your solemn days in the beginnings or in the first days of your months, you shall blow. With the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that you, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am your God, right? I am the Lord your God. Again, we just um bringing this out to show that the Yorubas indeed do keep the new moon feast days, but here the author decided to equate it to moon worship. All right, so. We're about to get into a few more references concerning the Yoruba and even some of their um, subclans. So the Yoruba Jews of Africa, as discussed earlier, the Yoruba would be Northern Kingdom Israelites. Now let's look at a couple of references holding the same view. And the first source we're going to run to is the Yoruba of Southwestern Nigeria. All right. And we're just going to start right here where it states that um, let's see, let's see. Earlier writers had noted similarities to Jewish customs or to Jewish customs, one identifying Yoruba as one of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. All right. But although we still have some Yoruba converts that um converted to Islam who acclaim Mecca as their or origin or point to that as their point of origin, as um stated earlier. In the beginning, two um references we brought out that, you know, it's not possible for these people to have come from Mecca, and that's according to their old traditions. All right, so now we got to jump to Orisha journeys, the role of the travels, and the birth of the Yoruba Atlantic religions. All right, and we're just about to start right here in this section right here, where it states that the Akus. Or basically, let's not start there. Let's start up here and get some more background information. So the Yoruba-speaking people or the Yoruba-speaking area of Africa boasts a millennial history of urbanism, travel, and trade. And there are indications of or there are indications that Yoruba speakers found the environments of Salvador, Havana, Freetown, and Port of Spain relatively familiar. Mid-19th century observers in all these places voice strikingly similar 
stereotypes of the local Yoruba communities as effectively organized and economically savvy. Clark writes in Sierra Leone in 1843 that the Akus, all right, so the Akus are a Yoruba tribe, is also spelled O-K-U, all right, so it's sometimes spelled as A-K-O-O, sometimes spelled as O-K-U, all right, so the Akus, who form a great portion of a liberated of liberated Africans and preeminently distinguished for their love of, of trading and occasionally amass large sums for their fragile or fugile and industrial habits, the Akus are called the African Jews, all right? So once again, we have this Yoruba tribe, the Akus, they are known or called the African Jews. All right, next source, six months service in the African blockade from April to October, 1884, all right? Once again, the Akus are the Jews of Africa and many of them having amassed fortunes returned to their country. All right, so this was a very rich, a very prosperous um, Yoruba clan, the Akus. Once again, they're known as the Jews of Africa. They more frequently become converts to Mohammedism, all right, than Christianity. So a lot of them have um, ended up converting to Islam. And unfortunately, we know those events that happened in West Africa with the Jihads, with the Amirats, with um, Askia Muhammad, the Berbers, the Fulanis, right? So we know um, a lot of those Islamic invasions happen. He goes on to say the former offering a plurality of wives and dealing in charms and the marvelous accords better with their ideas. All right. So another quick source, accounts and papers, 28, um, the 28 volumes. All right. And it states right here, we're going to go down to, let's see, number five. And this is um actually Government House Sierra Leone, July 18th, 1853. This is a copy of a dispatch from Governor Kennedy to the Duke of Newcase. All right. And it says, regarding the cool, it says this peculiar people who may be termed the Jews of Africa. All right. This peculiar people who may be termed the Jews of Africa are so cleanish and so band together, governed by laws and customs of their town, excuse me, of their own, administered by a king or headman, reside in the colony, all right? And this is regarding the coups, and we know it's regarding the coups because it um, says this in the prize, um, the prize stanza right here. And number four, it says, as I extended my inquiries, I found that the liberated Africans resided in the colony more especially the Aku race, all right? So this is who he was referring to when he called them the Jews of Africa, the Akus. Continuing on, we're going to go to this book right here, dealing with the Ijibu, all right? The Ijibu of the Yoruba, all right? Once again, the Ijibu is a another Yoruba clan. And it says the Ijibu were well known for the irresponsible flair for trading. All right. So they were traders. This conjunction with their versatility and, and countlessness of other productive um, ventures earned them the accolade or accolade the Jews of Nigeria. All right. So they was coined the term the Jews of Nigeria. Once again, we know the history of the Yoruba. That's why we, you know, went through all that information we went through in the beginning. So once we get to these references of Yoruba tribes being called Jews, you know, it, it wouldn't be any confusion. It goes on to say the Ijibu or the Ijibu traded in um, a variety of imported articles such as chainware, printed cloths, rum, gins, guns, beads for slaves. All right. Yes, they had slaves. Um, all our people had slaves. So it's really not nothing. Next source, selected themes in the study of the religions in Nigeria. Just um, beating your head in um, with these sources right here. Um, let's see what we're going to start at for this. Let's start right here. It says, in the estimation of Anyandeli, who did a full-length monographic study on the Ijibu, had said that the Ijibu stand very high in Africa in general 
and in Nigeria in particular. On the same breath, Anyandiel priced the Ijibu peoples as the Jews of Nigeria. All right. So once again, the Ijibu are known as the Jews of Nigeria, as well as the Aku are known as the Jews of Nigeria or the Jews of Africa, rather. And of course, according to the Oyo traditional, you know, the Oyo traditional Yoruba chronicles, they indeed are descendants of Israelites from the Assyrian exile. So we see this lining up, you know, each time we go. One more source in the middle, a cross-cultural analysis. It says sometimes the appellation Jews of X is the only reference we have to the comparison which um, has been made. In the recent times, the Kwahu have been called the Jews of Ghana. All right. And the Kwahu are actually a Akan ethnic group or a Khan subgroup. So we know ultimately they would uh, be of Israelite origin as well. But it goes on to say, while during the slave trade, the Ijibu were called the Jews of Yoruba land. All right. And of course, some of these Ijibu got caught up in the slave trade. So even during the slave trade, they were known as the Jews of Yoruba land. All right. And even this right here, this is coming from travel and tourism. All right. Global recognition of Queen Sheba's burial site in Ijibu land will boost tourism. All right. And this is something we're going to have to get into later because it's a lot of information regarding this um, subject on if the Queen of Sheba actually was buried in Nigeria. But it says right here, indigenous Ijibu people are of Jewish descent and that the Queen of Sheba of Ethiopia was buried in a part of Ijibu land. All right, just again right here, hinting at this fact. All right, let's start right here. It says on Jewish Ijibu and Ijibu Ebos. That's interesting. It says a finding... Finding what is interesting, in 2006, Awajiel was marking his 70th birthday. He granted an interview to the news magazine where he said that the Ijibus are Jews and that it is not only the Ijibus that are Jews, but we have some Ijibu Ebos that are Jews as well. All right, he goes on to name other people that are Jews. He says we have uh, Ichiri people that are Jews. And he says there are some people in the Banu two that are Jews, and we know those people that went down into Banu and Calabar, which would be your Fik, your BBO, people of that sort. And he also says there are even Jews among the Kanuri, all right? So just bringing it out one more time, solidifying that there are Israelite clans or there are tribes amongst the Yoruba that, you know, have been known to be Jews or called Jews. All right, so next source right here, African Jewish Journeys, Studies in African Judaism, all right? And this is um, one of the last sources we're about to get into before we wrap up this video uh, and get into questions if anybody has some. So if you have any questions, so go ahead and get them ready before we wrap it up. But again, African Jewish Journeys, Studies in African Judaism, it says... Two of the largest ethnic groups in Nigeria maintain parallel beliefs and descent from ancient Semitic, if not outright Israelite tribes, all right? So court chronicles of the Yoruba, whose ancestral home in, in southwest Nigeria invoke a lineage that follows the Assyrian conquest of ancient Israel, right? And that's what we just brought out earlier, the um, information dealing with the um, author Derek Lane. So, again, as it stated, according to the court chronicles of the Yoruba, all right, it provokes or it invokes a lineage that follows the conquest of the ancient Israel, the Syrian conquest of the ancient Israel, all right? It goes on to say the Yoruba beliefs and Israelite origin do not evoke a specific tribe from which they supposedly descend. Other Yorubas assume the mantle of the sons of Ephraim, all right? So other Yorubas believed him to be of the sons of Ephraim. And this could also be why you have the Emo Yoquayim, right? The Jews that came down from Timbuktu that was called the Bani Ephraim, 
right, that came and settled amongst these Yorubas. It could be because they knew that these people were their brethren. They could it could be because they knew that they were from the tribe of Ephraim. Because again, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with that story of the Jews coming down from Timbuktu settling in the Undo district of the the um, Nigeria amongst the Yoruba. They themselves that came from Timbuktu claim to be sons of Ephraim. All right, so again, that is very interesting. And now we have the last source we will be getting to um, kind of solidifies this whole point that we be on um, that I brought out with all the sources, with all the information. Um, like I said, this kind of solidifies the whole point. And as you can read by the title, the history of African gene flow in Southern Europeans, Levantines and Jews. And we got to learn how to um, digest this literature and understand what these people are actually saying. So let's read it. <clears throat> so this paper basically is dealing with, you know, certain um, African gene flows within these populations, such as Europeans, Levantines, and Jews. So specifically, of course, we will be looking at the section regarding the Jews. So it states that we also detect three to five percent sub-Saharan African ancestry in all eight of the diverse Jewish populations that we analyzed. All right, we probably know they did the Sephardics, the um, Ashkenazi, the Mizrahi, the Yemeni, the Iraqi, you know, so-called Israelite uh, populations as that. It states that for the Jewish admixture, we obtained an average estimated date of about 72 generations. All right, so that can be up to about a thousand years. So this ancestry, this admixture of Sub-Saharan African DNA in the Jewish admixture goes back 72 generations. So like I said, that's possibly thousands of years. So it says that this may reflect descent of these groups from a common ancestral population that already has some African ancestry prior to the Jewish diaspora. All right. So let me read that again. This may reflect descent of these Jewish groups from a common ancestral population that already had some African ancestry prior to the Jewish populations. Now, before I move on, we know today that the Israelite population, the true Israelite population, is amongst the Sub-Saharan is amongst the Sub-Saharan Africans, or they will be called Sub-Saharan Africans today. So when it says we det also detect three to five Sub-Saharan African ancestry in all eight of these Jewish populations we analyze, it is because three to five percent of those Jews actually share ancestry with these Sub-Saharan Africans, as they call them. But we know them to be the ancient Israelites of old. So again, it says this admixture goes back 72 ge generations before the Jewish diaspora. This is important because for most analysis, use the Yoruba Nigerians was represented as the Sub-Saharan Africans that was within the original Israelite ancestry. So again, the Yoruba Nigerians represented the Sub-Saharan Africans within this analysis, showing that they were already amongst the original Israelite population. You want to read this whole paper i'll put the link in the bio later on but again this is just showing that they used the nigerian yoruba dna in these ancient samples of these eight jewish populations that match three to five percent of them so again the yoruba would have have been amongst that you um that original israelite diaspora that original israelite population in the levant before being exiled um, into Africa, basically. And with that, that's all I have, family. I hope you all enjoyed the lesson. And again, if you all have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. I'll stick around for a couple more minutes. Hope you all enjoyed it. Man, I appreciate you all for watching, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Again, we pretty much uh, 
put the whole Canaanite theory um to rest because um these people cannot descend from Canaanites. Um, even if we get into the DNA of the Canaanites, these people will not even be related to Canaanites. You know, your Bantus, your Ebos, your Yorubas, your people of that sort, they are not related to um ancient Sub-Saharan Africans. So they wouldn't be related to your Neolithics or your, your Egyptian groups, your Hamites, basically. They wouldn't be related to these people. You know, so at some point they would have had to migrate into Africa, you know. And we showed, according to the Oyo Yoruba Chronicles, that they indeed um, claim or provoke, invoke a heritage from that diaspora that came from that Assyrian exile. We showed you the traditions and customs that are pretty much seen in the Old Testament. You know, we showed you the references of these people being known as the Jews of Africa. And we showed you that these people were actually um, amongst that original Israelite population that was said to be mixed with um, African. But again, we know that the original um, Israelites uh, are those Sub-Saharan Africans of today, rather than those eight populations that they tested. That's why only three to five percent of them actually are related to us, and not all of them. So again. Pose your questions now. All right, who are who are the Arabs in the Bible today? I can show you a quick source on that real quick. Show you two sources um and give you a quick verbal answer. Esau, as well as Ishmael, would be the progenitors of the Arab race today. Even even when we get into that word Arab, it can be considering a lot of people. It can be considering a lot of sons of Shem. It can be considering Moab. Edom, Ishmael, you know, it just depends on, you know, what specific people you're talking about and what that people trace their ancestry back to. But let me get this up for you real quick. This is literally, um, this is literally on the Blue Letter Bible app. You can go to this search Esau Strong's H6215 Esau. Go down here to outline biblical usage. Esau Harry, eldest son of Isaac and Rebecca, twin brother of Jacob, sold the birthright for food when he was a hungry and divine blessing with Jacob, progenitor of the Arab peoples. All right. Not all Arabs will be Edomites, but um, you do have Edomites that are Arabs, if that makes sense. The brother said, are the Ijah Israelites? Two, that's where my wife is from. They live in Nigeria. Um, I will have to do further research into that to see. But for now, I'll just say I'm not sure. But I can do a quick Google search and see what I can find. Yeah, I, do, I know that doesn't really answer your question to the fullest, but in order to answer who the Arabs are, I will have to do a full breakdown because, again, there's many different Arab tribes. You have Bedouins, you have uh, Berbers, you have, you know, all these different branches of Arabs that goes back to different sons of Shem. You know, people like to say Ishmael are the Arabs. Well, he's only the father of certain Arabian tribes. So is Esau. So is Moab. So in order to find out who all these Arabs are today, you know, that I have to be a whole separate video, a whole deep, in-depth um, discussion. You know what I'm saying? There are um, Arabs in North Africa. There are Arabs in West Africa. There are Arabs in East Africa. There are Arabs in the Levant, Saudi Arabia, Yemen. So, again, it'll take more. Um, it'll take a full breakdown, brother. No problem, no problem. But, but again, just remember, man. Consider when it, when it comes to Arab, that is a generic term. It really doesn't pinpoint ancestry. So, like I said. Edomite can be an Arab, Ishmaelite can be an Arab, um, 
Moabite can be considered an a Arab. So, so is there any more questions? Anybody got any more questions before we head out? Any video suggestions? Any people you all would like me to dig into? Has a written tour been found in Africa? The only written tour I know that's been found in Africa would be um, amongst those Ethiopians. I believe they have one of the oldest Bibles, actually. So, other than the Bible dealing with the Ethiopians or the Bible that the Ethiopians had, those um, early um, invaders to East Africa, I wouldn't know of um, any other written Torah being found in Africa besides like Torah scrolls that our people had in like the kingdom of Ghana and stuff like that. We didn't have like full Torahs, but we had certain like stories, certain scrolls. Eldad the Danite said that the Jews had their um, own Talmud that included the book of Isaiah and things like that. Let me actually see if I can bring that out for you since you asking. Give me a second. I know what book is saying. See if I can bring that out for you real quick. Give you an example. Even though uh, the Benai Ephraim, who settled amongst the Yoruba, supposedly had a Torah scroll written on parchment paper. But again, let me see if I can find that for you real quick, because I do have an example of that. I just got to find it in reference to what Eldad was stating about his people. All right, so yeah, here we go. Share my screen real quick. And again, make sure you all put your questions in the chat if you have any. If not, I will be wrapping it up after I show um, this source right here for the family. All right, so this Hebrewisms of West Africa. Let me just start right here. All right, so Eldad, son of Mali, the Danite, alleged that he was a descendant from the tribe of Dan. He related that his tribe had migrated from their Palestinian home so as not to take part in the civil war at the time of Jerusalem's secession. All right, and they were residing in the land of Havila beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. All right, so even Eldad stated that the Jews or the, the tribes were beyond the rivers of Ethiopia just as Hosea stated. But again, three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, with them, these had joins in the time of Sennacherib, all right? Time of the Assyrian exile, which we just uh, reviewed. It says they had the entire body of scriptures bearing Esther and Lamentations, all right? So this getting into your question. It says they had an entire body of scriptures bearing Esther and Lamentation. They knew neither of the Mishnah nor of the Talmud, but they had a Talmud of their own, in which all the laws were recited in the name of Joshua, son of Nun, as he had received them at the hands of Moses. All right. So that's just an example of what um you was asking as far as written Torah being found in Africa or being amongst our people coming into Africa. Indeed, indeed, you are of the tribes of Israel, my brother. You are of the tribes of Israel, man. Our people came into Africa and we took over. So that's what we got to understand. Um, I'm really trying to get some information together to do a video titled um, Reconquest of um, Canaan, West Africa version. Because, man, I'm telling you, our people came in and they, they took over. They basically took over. They they turned things upside down. 
they um they were responsible for agriculture they were responsible for for iron working they were responsible for bringing in certain cattle you know they were responsible for um the kingdom of Ghana for the kingdom of Mali Oyo Empire they were responsible for for a lot of things in Africa so yeah man I want to do that but I do plan on if most high willing if I get enough time tonight or before tomorrow I do plan on doing another video tomorrow um just bringing out some more information solidifying um who our Ebo brothers will be or who our Ebo brothers are and bringing out the history of that so again I see no more questions within the chat I say toda to everybody for watching Shalom, shalom, and I pray the most high continue to bless you all as well. And I thank you all for tuning in and enjoy you all Shabbat. All right, shalom.